every child, regardless of race, income level, or zip code, deserves an equal playing field of opportunity to access the American dream. Making that goal a reality begins in our schools. The evidence is clear. An analysis of 41 major urban areas found that Black and Hispanic students made the largest gains in, educa in educational access because of school choice, according to a Credo study. That is why President Trump has been clear in saying in his State of the Union, for too long, countless American children have been trapped in failing government schools. To rescue these students, 18 states have created school choice in the form of opportunity scholarships. The programs are so popular that tens of thousands of students remain on a waiting list. Now I, go, I call on Congress to give one million American children the same opportunity. Pass the Education Freedom Scholarships and Opportunities Act, he said, because no parents should be forced to send their child to a failing government school. Well now, if Democrats have their way, children will not have access to schools at all. And that is not acceptable to President Trump. President Trump continues to fight for equal opportunity in our schools by boldly and firmly underscoring the absolute necessity of America's schools to reopen this fall. The data is clear. Sustained school closures hurt students who have fewer resources the most. McKinsey and Co. created these models, I have some graphs for you, to estimate the potential impact of school closures, and they found this, quote, how much learning students lose during school closures varies significantly by access to remote learning, the quality of remote instruction, home support, and the degree of engagement. As you can see in this chart, students who experience average quality remote learning progress, but at a slower pace. Students who are getting lower quality remote learning stagnate at current grade levels, and students who are not getting instruction at home lose significant ground with some students dropping out altogether. As you can see in the three scenarios mapped on this graph, if students return to school in the fall, the disparities are far less than if they return in January of next year or the fall of next year, where disparities in learning are enormous. But school closures affect more than just learning. As the NAACP has pointed out, for students of color at all levels across the country, school closings create problems even more urgent than the interruption of their educations. Schools also serve as a community nexus for food and for housing. Rest assured that President Trump knows more than anyone the importance of opening our schools, which is why he has been the most vocal advocate for reopening. And President Trump's America, make no mistake that he will continue to be the biggest fighter for equal opportunity in our schools and continued access to the American dream for all. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you, Kaylee. Uh, I'm just curious, after today's Supreme Court rulings, how is President Trump feeling about the two justices that he appointed to the Supreme Court, Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh, who ruled against him today. Well, the justices are entitled to uh, their opinion. This is an independent branch of government. Um, but as for the decision, uh, President Trump um, underscored to me, I was just in the Oval Office with him, that it was Justice Kavanaugh who pointed out in the New York State court case that there was unanimous agreement that this should be remanded to D.C., uh, to the, excuse me, to the district court where the president may raise constitutional and legal arguments. That was unanimous agreement. Um, also, there was a note in the Roberts opinion uh, that the New York State case, um, basically the grand jury uh, said that they were prohibited from arbitrary fishing expeditions and initiating investigations out of malice or intent to harass. Uh, so that language made it pretty clear uh, that this was a win for the president. When you, when you were speaking to the president in the Oval Office, did he have anything to say specifically about Justices Gorsuch or Kavanaugh? We didn't speak specifically about the two justices. Okay, and if I could, one question about the CDC's guidelines. Yesterday, about reopening schools, yesterday uh, the vice president came out and said that um, he said that the CDC was going to be putting out new guidelines next week in terms of reopening. But the head of the CDC, he was on another network this morning and said that they would not be changing those guidelines. They would just be putting out some additional documents. So can you can you explain the discrepancy between those two? So the CDC director noted that there would be additional guidance. The vice president noted that as well. But we're on the same page with, uh, with Dr. Redfield, who has said, I don't want this guidance to be a reason for schools not to be 
to reopen. Um, and he said that these were not meant to be prescriptions. They are guidelines. Ultimately, it's up to state and local governments as to what their guidelines look like. There are 47 states who have issued their own guidelines so far. And I would also note that the CDC recognizes in their guidelines uh, that many of these things that they're recommending are not feasible, which is why they use the words the not possible 18 times and not feasible nine times. We want our schools to reopen. It's imperative uh, for the health and well-being of the child. Yes. Thanks, Kaylee. Uh, you said yesterday that you had asked the president whether he supports the idea of staggered school reopening schedules where kids go to school on some days, not others. Um, did you have a chance to talk to him? Yeah, I did endeavor to get with him on that today, but because of the Supreme Court ruling, we didn't quite get to that yet. But it is on my list of things to follow up with him about. And then to follow up, so I'm sorry, it's two different things that the vice president and Dr. Redfield described. One was changing the guidelines, the guidance that, that was previously re really released. And what Dr. Redfield discussed this morning was just adding supplemental guidance. Um, which of, of those is actually happening? And is the White House, in addition, also planning to release its own guidance? Well, I think Dr. Redfield was noting um, he doesn't plan to rescind the current guidance that's out there. Um, there it will be supplemental guidance, but these are not requirements and not prescriptive. Uh, it was the way he characterized the initial guidance, and he said that this guidance should not be used as a reason uh, for schools not to reopen. We all have the same goal here, and it's for schools to reopen because the health of the child absolutely depends on it, and it's imperative as the presentation I showed uh, to rectify disparities that we get these schools open. And sorry, is the White House releasing an additional document as well? I have no announcements on that. Um, none in the works, but doesn't mean that it won't happen. Yes. Okay, thank you, Kaylee. I'll try to barrel through these quickly. Are the president's taxes still under audit, and specifically which years? Uh, the president's taxes are still under audit. I don't have years for you. Okay, let me ask you if I can. He could release his taxes at any time. This case went all the way to the Supreme Court. His own nominees ruled against him. Why shouldn't the American public at this point believe that the president has something he's trying to hide? Uh, first, let me note something. Uh, the taxes are under audit. He said he released, he would release them when they are no longer under audit. Uh, the justices Obviously did not. The justices did not rule against him. In fact, it was a unanimous opinion, uh, saying that this needs to go back to the district court. And they even recognized that the president has an ample arsenal of arguments uh, that he can make. And in fact, I would show that the Vance majority laid out a roadmap for the president. The Vance majority said. The president has the right to challenge the subpoena on any grounds permitted by state law, be it bad faith or undue burden or breadth. They went on to say the president can raise subpoena-specific constitutional challenges, uh, and they specifically mention a violation of the supremacy clause as one thing that he can raise. So they essentially laid out a roadmap. Uh, this, his justices did not rule against So him. to be clear, okay, fine. I don't dispute anything that you just said. What I'm asking, though, is the president, whatever the court says, the president can release his taxes whenever he likes. So why shouldn't Americans at this point believe that the president isn't trying to hide something in there? You know, the media has been asking this question for four years, and for four years the president has said the same thing. His taxes are under audit, um, and when they're no longer under audit, he will release them. But I would also note the excruciating ruling for House Democrats, who were very much called out for their partisan games. Uh, they also subpoenaed the president's uh, information, financial information, and Justice Roberts said, far from accounting for separation of powers concerns, the House's approach aggravates them by leaving essentially no limits on the congressional power to subpoena the president's personal records. So leave it to House Democrats who did a partisan impeachment, a political witch hunt against this president. And this was yet another part, only to be rebuked by the Supreme Court. Let me ask about coronavirus. Just my, just my follow-up, if I may, on coronavirus quickly, Kaylee. Hospitalizations in the country are up 50 percent since mid-June. How can the president say that the country is in good shape right now? So I would know with hospitalizations, Hospitalizations um, in a lot of these hospitals. I, I spoke with Dr. Burks this morning about 10 to 40 percent in the hospitals reaching high capacity are COVID. So a lot of hospitalizations aren't pertaining to COVID. Um, what I would also so note, and I'm glad. Hospitalizations is not because of COVID? Well, a lot of it is elective surgeries and other surgeries that have opened up. About 10 to 40 percent in the hospitals reaching capacity are COVID related. Um, but I'm glad that you asked about COVID because I do want to take a moment to highlight some of the things that the federal government has done. Can you answer my uh, question first we're, why we're in good shape? right now with hospitalizations going up in spite of what you said about elective surgery. Well, one of the things I would note is the mortality rate, which has had, if you look at the weekend numbers, a tenfold decrease, you could argue an even greater decrease if you compare to some of our highest days. Uh, we're seeing the fatality rate in this country come down. Uh, that is a very good thing. We grieve when any one, even one life is lost, but I think uh, it's progress as we enter uh, the next phase of this. But aren't a lot yes. of other people Thank seriously you, Kaylee. ill, Kayla? Uh, so 
Thank you, Daly. On, on the China, so the, the administration today rolled out some sanctions against high-level Chinese officials over the Uyghur abuses. But can you speak overall what that does to the U.S. relationship with, with China, and does it jeopardize the phase one deal? Look, I think um, with regard to, I, I look at these Magnitsky Act sanctions and the administration does, um, not with regard to phase one China deal. These are very serious sanctions uh, that were put in place um, by this administration to take strong action against the um, human rights abuses of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I, I just want to emphasize and underscore that we sanctioned officials, um, several of them, the party secretary, um, his former deputy, and its current party secretary. It's also its former um, its former party secretary. Uh, so that was three. Um, and today's announcement is the latest in a series of actions by the Trump administration. So it's not just the sanctions that were put in place. There were export controls. Controls. The president signed the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act. So we've taken a very strong stance on the side of human rights and against the atrocities we've seen. And just so the American public knows, um, some of these atrocities have been um, forced abortions and sterilizations and really despicable things that have been done. So the message you're communicating to the Chinese is that this issue is is separate from the phase one trade agreement. It's a, a human rights is, is a paramount issue. It's very important. Uh, we took action. We've crafted a phase one deal. Um, we hope the Chinese government will honor that. Jack. Uh, thanks, Gailey. You, you mentioned that the court decision today was a win. It didn't, it didn't sound from the president's tweets this morning that he viewed it that way. Has, has his thinking on it changed? Has, He's had more time to digest. You know, the president uh, was making a general point about deference um, on the principle of absolute immunity, um, which is the posture that the admit that the president took in court. Um, you know, he believes there should have been more deference there. Uh, Justice Alito, citing the Harvard Law Review, made a very good point that constitutionally speaking, the president never sleeps. The president must be ready at a moment's notice to do whatever it takes to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution and the American people. And we wish there would have been more deference to that point of view, but it is a big win, as Justice Kavanaugh noted, that all nine justices said this needs to be remanded back to the lower court, um, and that, in fact, uh, the attorney, Cy Vance, uh, had not established his ability to secure access to those records. Instead, further proceedings are required. Giving, giving the opportunity for the U.S. attorney in New York to look at those documents is no doubt not something the president is happy about. I'm wondering, in general, if after this ruling and the ruling on DACA, the ruling on LGBT rights, the ruling on the census, um, whether the president regrets at all his criticism of, of judges, in particular Justice uh, Roberts. Justice, no, I think what the president, uh, what has un been underscored to him after all of these uh, rulings is that, you know, he we need more conservative justices on the court. I mean, that's something he's very strong about it, uh, prompted him to say he'll release a list of more conservative justices he wants on the court. So I think that's been the big takeaway, uh, not particularly with regard to this ruling, but with the previous ones that you mentioned. There are, there are conservative judges on the court now. It's a five to four. Yes, and then there was a nine to zero unanimous decision that this needed to be re remanded, and there was a roadmap as I noted, um, a roadmap set forward um, on how to proceed in the lower court. And there were several arguments proposed that the president could make in lower court. Yes, Kate. I've got two questions for you. One on these rulings today. The Supreme Court is rejecting this assertion from the president that he is immune to investigation while he's in office. Does he agree with that he is not immune? Um, well, where the president stands is he still maintains uh, his initial position, and he agrees with Justice Thomas in the dissent, who said the demands on the president's time and the importance of his tasks are extraordinary, and the office of the president cannot be delegated to subordinates. A subpoena imposes both demands on the president's limited time and a burden, and he went on to describe that position. But so he agrees with the dissent. Not he, he agrees with the dissent by Justice Thomas. So he takes issue with the um, the point that the majority made on absolute immunity. But nevertheless, I would underscore the victory here. Um, as Cy Vance, uh, the attorney, was not given what he wanted, which so was access to the records. He still thinks immunity is he's immune to investigation. The president still stands beside the posture uh, that he made. He accepts any Supreme Court opinion as the law of the land, but nevertheless doesn't change his viewpoint. Um, he can disagree with the opinion, but he certainly will follow it. And on coronavirus, my second question on coronavirus, I'll be quick. Um, you're saying that you don't want these CDC guidelines to be one size fits all, overly prescriptive about how these schools reopen. So why is the administration making it one size fits all that they all need to reopen 
fully and at the same time? Because there's a way to safely do it, and there's a lot at stake. Um, you know, I mentioned the 67,000 uh, pediatricians rec rec represented by the American Academy of Pediatrics who say it's imperative schools reopen. That was underscored by another 1,500 United Kingdom pediatricians. The costs are high when, you know, your network, um, CNN, is reporting about child abuse. I mentioned the study yesterday. I was a good, right. no good piece no by one, CNN no that in Massachusetts that alone reports of alleged child abuse dropped almost 55 percent because when kids are not in school, a lot of times we don't catch that abuse. The costs are too high to keep schools shut down. They can safely reopen. Even the American Academy of Pediatrics believes that, and the president's going to stand on the side of the child always. And no one is disagreeing yes. with that about child abuse, but I'm saying how can you say you're not going to tell all the schools how to reopen, but you're going to tell them all when to reopen? There are, 40, there are 47 guidelines issued by the states. Um, there's local uh, guidelines that have been put in place. This can be done safely. It can be done well. Um, in the American Academy of Pediatrics, I've pointed out um, a lot of what they've put out. they put out their own set of guidelines. There's a number of guidelines floating out there, and we believe there's a way to safely do this, and the child will always come first in this administration. Yes. Thank you, Kelly. A logical follow-up to Caitlin's first line of questioning, though, is if the president still believes he has absolute immunity, it makes him sound as though he thinks he's above the law while he's president of the United States, at least. It's, it's a very, it's, it, it's almost as if um, folks don't understand a legal term of art. Absolute immunity is a legal term of art. And, you know, I can go and describe that, and maybe I can best describe that um, by quoting Alexander Hamilton, who was referenced in the Thomas opinion. And Alexander Hamilton really created the posture and the outlook that laid the foundation for the notion of absolute immunity. And it was this, energy in the executive is a leading character in the definition of good government. It is essential to the protection of the community against foreign attacks. It is not less essential to the steady administration of the laws to the protection of property against those irregular and high-handed combinations which sometimes interrupt the ordinary course of justice to the security of liberty against the enterprises and assaults of amb ambition of faction and of anarchy a feeble executive implies a feeble execution of the government and the point he was making is that, is that the executive is imbued with many constitutional authorities, many responsibilities to protect this nation from threats foreign and domestic, and he must be able to operate unencumbered. That's where the proposition of absolute immunity comes from, and that is what the administration was defending in court. Um, and we are pleased by the 9 to 0 opinion to send this back to the lower court, uh, though we are not pleased by the absolute immunity component. Well, perhaps, yes. could you, uh, David, could you expand a little bit on Education Secretary DeVos's comments today about um, He's not going to cut funding to, to schools, but to shift funding to families. Do you, do you know what that means? And the second question unrelated is, does the White House have a comment on the uh, retirement yesterday of uh, Colonel Finman from the Army? So uh, to your first question, I did not see Secretary DeVos's comments, but as you describe them, it leads me to believe uh, that it was a reference to the president's um, tweet yesterday about changing education funding if schools don't reopen. Um, as I noted yesterday, uh, what this administration's goal is, is that funding be tied to the child, not to a school district where schools are staying closed. That's our paramount guiding principle as to what that looks like in action. Uh, that will be forthcoming. We're hopeful that all the schools reopen in the nation. That's the goal. And we are hopeful for more education funding in phase four, as I noted. Um, and with Colonel Vindman, you know, I'm not going to focus uh, or comment on a former uh, junior employee. I know the White House has not spoken to him since he left, and I would refer you for further to the Army. Is there any pressure yes. from the White House to for no. him to retire? Yes. Kaylee, picking up on the coronavirus questions in schools, though, North Carolina, for instance, has seen a record high number of coronavirus-related hospitalizations, more than 1,000 today, and that's a five-day rising count for those hospitalizations. So it's the White House's position that schools in North Carolina and hard-hit areas by coronavirus should absolutely reopen next month? It is our opinion that schools should reopen. I'd refer you to Dr. Redfield, who said yesterday, head of CDC, uh, this virus has a very limited effect on kids. Um, he went on to say, unlike the flu, kids are not driving the transmission cycle. Uh, he's in agreement with Dr. Scott Atlas, Atlas, a former chief of neuroradiology at Stanford, who said children under 18 have virtually zero risk of death from COVID, virtually zero risk of serious illness, which was also underscored by Yale School of Public Health uh, professor Albert Coe, the bottom line is that the impacts of COVID-19 on children is minimal or very low compared to other age groups. But you know what is at risk for children is people not reporting child abuse, is these very
very serious consequences um, that, that are at play in the educational disparity I noted when kids stay home from school. Dr. Berg's also said yesterday, however, that there wasn't enough data on how this affects children because they weren't originally testing children at the same rate as adults. But to the point about places like, again, North Carolina, where they have been hard hit, you think that they should absolutely reopen next month? We believe uh, that they should absolutely reopen the schools in this country, that kids are at very low risk. And I would also quote to you the American Academy of Pediatrics. I, I would venture to say those 67,000 pediatricians care very deeply about the children that they treat. And they have said uh, that children and adolescents are at considerable, considerable risk of morbidity and in some cases mortality should they stay home from school. This president will fight for the health and well-being of children. Yes. Emma. Oh, thank you, Kaylee. Um, a study that came out of Detroit last week about hydroxychloroquine, which the president tweeted about, uh, showed that it cuts deaths in half, yet the American people have been told by government agencies like the FDA and some government medical experts that it is not effective for coronavirus. So what is the American people supposed to think? What is the official position from the administration? on this possible therapy. So I'm, I'm glad you've asked this. The president has always said that he sees hydroxychloroquine as a very promising prophylactic, but that every uh, person should not take it unless they get a prescription from their doctor. That's paramount, very important. Um, the president has taken it himself as a prophylactic. Um, and I would note that there's been a lot of wrong studies out there that were heavily touted. Like there was a Lancet study uh, that was published and many in the media uh, pounced on this Lancet study and it questioned hydroxychloroquine um, and you had folks like NBC's Glenn Kirshner saying the president should resign over the Lancet study questioning hydroxychloroquine. And CNN spent over 90 minutes heralding the study that's now debunked, that has been detracted. But what we have found, though the Lancet study has been retracted, we have seen a Henry Ford Health System study. Uh, and that Henry Ford Health System study uh, showed that it is very promising, leading CNN to now tweet a surprising new study found that the controversial anti-malarial drug hydroxychloroquine helped COVID-19 patients better survive in hospitals. Uh, and the CEO of Henry Ford Medical Group said it's important to note that in the right settings, this potentially could be a lifesaver for patients. So our position is where we always were, where the president was weeks and weeks before the study ever came out, that this was a promising drug, uh, but it should only be taken in consultation with your doctor. So is the, is the FDA going to reauthorize it for emergency use? I would refer you to the FDA on that. Okay. Yes. One more, if I may, on um, a follow-up to what the president talked about a few weeks ago regarding Antifa, saying that his administration planned to designate it as a terrorist organization. We haven't really heard anything else about that. Is that still the plan, or when is that happening? So that was the Department of Justice um, saying that they will prosecute um, these cases as domestic terrorist cases. Um, so I'd refer you to the DOJ as to how that's working operationally. But the DOJ has arrested many individuals, uh, including seven out in Portland, Oregon, for a variety of offenses, including attacks on law enforcement. So we're working hard to ensure that Antifa uh, does not dominate the streets. This administration stands against that kind of lawlessness. I think they should still be designated a terrorist organization. See, the president stands by what he said. Yes. Thank you. Chanel. Thank you, Kaylee. Uh, my question, one question on Cyrus Vance, the, the New York DA who is demanding Trump's taxes. Um, Vance has a troubling history of protecting predators and attacking Republicans. Case in point for non-New Yorkers, in 2011, he worked to reduce Epstein's sexual predator status. In 2015, NYPD had audio evidence of Weinstein admitting rape and uh, Vance's office refused to prosecute. All this while attacking President Trump's uh, family and their enterprises. Given this history, what is President Trump's views of Vance from both a personal standpoint and a political standpoint? Is this Vance just, I mean, is he just politically abusing the court system? What is Frank Trump's views on him? Yeah, you raised some very good points about the partisan attorney uh, in Manhattan. Um, you know, Justice Alito said this in his opinion. It really stood out to me. He said, as for the potential use of subpoenas to harass, we need not exhibit a naivete from which ordinary citizens are free. As we have recognized, a president is an easily identifiable target. There are more than 2,300 local prosecutors and district attorneys in the country, many 
local prosecutors are elected, and many prosecutors have ambitions for higher elected office. Bring in Cy Vance, a Democrat, uh, someone who Justice Thomas pointed out something very interesting. Uh, Justice Thomas noted that the district attorney for the county of New York, Cyrus Vance, uh, served a subpoena on the president's personal accounting firm that, quote, was nearly identical to a subpoena issued by a congressional committee requesting nearly 10 years of the president's financial records. So the partisan attorney, uh, the Democrat from New York, is aiding and abetting uh, the Democrats, the lawless Democrats like Nancy Pelosi, who have pursued this president with bogus charges of collusion, with bogus charges um, in the impeachment inquiry, and are now pursuing this, only to be rebuked by the Supreme Court and assisted by Cy Vance. For, for non-lawyers, I mean, is there legal recourse against overly political DAs out here, or is this just a... Uh so, I'd have to, yeah, you know, this was an individual who was elected at the state level, so I guess the recourse would be the ballot box. Um, but I would also note, um, just on that point, that you, know, you have President Obama and Vice President Biden, Biden, who were caught spying on the Trump campaign, the opposition party. You had former Vice President Biden in the Oval Office just before the inauguration talking about the Logan Act. Uh, and later, the Logan Act was weaponized and used against Lieutenant General Michael Flynn uh, in a way that was so unfair and a grave miscarriage of justice. But you have Obama and Biden who get away with this, but yet we need to go investigate President Trump. It really is quite nonsensical. Yes. Thanks, Kaylee. Um, in President Trump's tweets about the Supreme Court decisions this morning, he said he thinks the court treated him differently than it would have treated other presidents. So does he think this was a political decision by the Supreme Court or that politics or personal views somehow entered into their legal reasoning? So I think you were referring to the tweet about broad deference and um, what he was trying to note there. Uh, what he was noting was just that there was should have been further deference to this notion that I read by Alexander Hamilton and others of absolute immunity to allow the executive and the president to do the very important job of protecting this country and all the other tasks given to a president of the United States. You said the Supreme Court gives a delay ruling that they would never have given for another president. Yeah, and one of the, I would also point you, um, with regards to that, I, I think Justice Alito hit on this. He said in the Clinton case, for example, the court held that a sitting president could be sued in federal courts, but the court took pains to reserve judgment on the question of whether a comparable claim might succeed in the state tribunal. Any direct control by a state court over the president, the court observed, might raise concerns about protecting federal officers from possible local prejudice. So that is to say that even back in the Clinton case where uh, federal court prosecutions were green-lighted. They gave their grave reservations for a state court proceeding of this nature. So I think he was noticing, noting the distinguishing features there. Yes. I'd like to ask a clarifying question from something that was said earlier. The president, you said, would like to see more conservative justices. Is he comfortable with the number of nine justices? There's nothing in the law that says he has to only have nine. Would he consider appointing more? So the president has never mentioned adding other justices, but the Democrat Party has as a way to get around, uh, I guess, the, the rulings they don't like. And I have a question about the unemployment numbers from today. Uh, 1.3 million additional claims in the last week. Uh, a bit of a slowing down of that recovery. Are you at all concerned that the numbers continue to be so high still almost four months into continued unemployment claims? So I would note that the numbers fell 100,000. This was the 14th consecutive weekly decline that we've seen. Um, and from its peak in late March, initial claims are down 5.6 million. Also looking at continuing claims, a number, another metric uh, that we that came out today, uh, they reflect actual benefit payments, and those fell 700,000 from its peak in May 8th the week of May 8th, and they are down nearly 7 million. And combined, as uh, Larry Kudlow was shared with me those facts, in May and June, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported that 8 million jobs gain. Uh, and as Larry likes to say, the V-shaped rebound uh, continues. Well, are there any concerns that those jobs uh, are not returning fast enough? Particularly today, the market seemed to notice the unemployment claims more so than it has in recent weeks. I would say that the two jobs reports, the 8 million together, both record-breaking months, are very encouraging. Signs, uh, and we like what we see on the horizon. Of course, there's more work to be done, but we have the jobs president at the helm to do that work. David. Hi, the um, health di department director in Tulsa has said uh, President Trump's rally there likely contributed to a big surge in coronavirus cases in the area. Does, does the president uh, now regret holding that rally? So we have not seen data to reflect that, and no, we don't regret holding the rally. Yes. Can I ask about uh, the visit yesterday by the Mexican president 
Um, can you tell us if President Trump discussed the issue of funding for the wall with the president? If not, is that now a dead issue for the president? Um, it didn't come up in the discussions that I was a part of, but I'm grateful that you bring up the wall, which is being built um, at accelerated pace, you know, more than 500 miles by the end of the year. And we really appreciate the help of the Mexican government um, in securing the border with the troops that they've provided. Does the president contend that the Mexican government may still contribute, like, directly to fund So, that? again, I, I'm not aware of their other discussions they may have had, but what I would note is the USMCA, that Mexico is a big part in making happen, is bringing tons and tons and tons of money and revenue into the United States, and we're very grateful for that. Yes. Hello. Thank you, Kaylee. Two quick questions. First of all, given United Airlines' recent announcement that they might have to furlough some 36,000 workers, uh, does the president support extending the aid that was already given to the airlines further? And second, on uh, vaccines, uh, does the president have any views on whether or not uh, K through 12 students should be mandated to get vaccinated against COVID-19 once a, a vaccine is safe and effective. So I haven't talked to him either about that point specifically on vaccinations or the airline extension, but I can circle back. Yes. Um, and so one thing I think I got to everyone. So just one last note I want to leave everyone with because I do think it's a very important point um, is just that there is a Rasmussen poll that came out recently that showed 64 percent of Americans are concerned about the growing criticism of America's police and that it will lead to a shortage of police officers and reduce public safety. And of all of the demographics polled, black Americans fear most for public safety, with 67 percent acknowledging their concern for this. And this is why President Trump has taken action, calling strongly to, for law and order and peace in our streets. And he's set the tone at the top for mayors and governors. Um, additionally, we've had the hundreds of federal arrests, the executive order that's enhanced our police departments, and Operation Legend, which I announced yesterday from the Justice Department, and on, in honor of Legend Talaferro, a four-year-old boy who was tragically killed in his sleep in Kansas City. And as we head into the weekend, uh, this is our last press briefing of the week, and so I just wanted to make a plea for peace in our streets because far too many children have been lost. It's important to know their names. It's important to see their faces. Um, and may we all hold in our prayer and keep close to our hearts the families of Natalia Wallace, who was seven, Makai James, who was 10, Bernardo Jones Jr., who was 14, Sincere Gaston, who was one, Lena Nunez, who was 10, Amaria uh, Jones, who was 13, Devon McNeil, who was 11, and Sequoria Turner down in Atlanta, who was eight. Let's make sure we have peace in our streets this weekend and hold these families in our prayers. Thank you.